Hello, I'm Norris Slayman Hadar, and as part of the final presentation for ESM 4106 Engineering Physiology, I will be discussing how electric eels produce fields outside of their bodies. I know you're probably wondering why an order earth diagram is pictured here instead of the eel in question, but the importance of southern Gondwana and its tectonic evolution will be key in our proceeding postulation, which ties evolution to the geotechnical dynamics of this planet, but bioelectrogenesis specifically with the megacontinents loose sedimentary particles present within the fish's ecosystem. Now, because of the need for a conductive medium, bioelectrogenesis actually evolved out of marine vertebrates. And what's distinct about these electric fish is that they possess an electric organ composed of battery-like cells called electrocytes. So here we have a pretty cool and pretty accurate drawing of an electric eel producing a head positive current. We'll get into the specifics of what this means as we move along the presentation, but I wanted to include a visual depiction of the ability in case somebody wasn't familiar. Before diving into the distinct mechanism behind these electric organs, I want to talk about neurons since the electricity produced by a fish is actually coming from their brains. A neuron, uh, we have pictured here on the top right corner, is composed of a cell body or soma, essentially a seed. Uh, Root-like extensions called dendrites receive information in the form of electrical signals, and when activated, the axon carries the information processed and integrated by the soma along long distances towards axon terminals. So in this analogy, the axon is the trunk whose branches terminate in a signal transmitting key information to the next cells in the chain. Uh, we think of this information as like, it's like the ripe fruit of a well-rooted and hopefully well-nourished tree. So nerves are pretty much just long axon bundles. And as we know, muscles are stimulated by nerves. Now this ties into the electric organ because electric organs evolved from non-contractile muscle cells. So as with all things in the balance, lost mechanical ability, the fish made up for itself with this external electrical ability. Now the cells that make up the organ are called electrocytes. And these electrocytes act like a set of batteries in series. So for those who aren't familiar, potential summation is the property exhibited by a serial battery configuration as opposed to the parallel configuration which would sum the current. So here with electric fish, the resulting potential or voltage because of the electrocytes compacted folded serial arrangement is the sum of neuronal activations on their excitable membranes which brings us to cell polarity. The resting potential of a cell is determined by the electrochemical gradient along its membrane because there are more negative ions on the inside of the cell relative to the outside, at rest the cell is negative, resting potential is negative. Now, there are more sodium ions outside of the cell relative to the inside and more potassium ions inside of the cell relative to the outside. And because of these gradients, the cell uses voltage-gated ion channels to mediate the action potential. So by flooding the cell with the positive sodium ions that were outside, the voltage-gated sodium channels are driving depolarization. Depolarization is the action taken by the neuron when dendrites are stimulated above a a certain threshold causing it to fire. Uh, we'll get into the action potential in the next slide. So as we just mentioned, ion channels are the drivers of this Boolean activation process, and I say Boolean because it's an all or nothing event. Either it occurs or it doesn't, and it's always the same regardless of how overstimulated the action trigger is. These voltage-gated channels have three states, closed, open, and inactivated, and action potential is produced when closed voltage-gated sodium channels are triggered to open. When they open, the flow of positive ions in through the membrane causes depolarization of the cell. The, the sodium channels remain open until peak potential or action potential. At that point, they inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open, causing repolarization by drawing potassium, positive potassium ions out. Because the, the potassium channels are a bit slow, the cell hyperpolarizes on the come down, this means that it becomes more negative than resting potential. So to restore the resting electrochemical gradient, the, the system uses a combination of ligand-gated channels and the sodium-potassium pump after hyperpolarization. Though this process accounts for 20 to 40 percent of the brain's total energy consumption, we won't be getting into the specifics since it's out of the scope of this presentation. Uh, I just want to note one last thing before moving on to the next slide is 
uh, something is about is a point about refractory here. Absolute refractory period is determined by the state of the sodium channel. It begins when the channel opens and persists until a after an activation, ending when the channel closes again at resting potential. During this re absolute refractory period, the neuron is not able to fire. During relative refractory, a neuron can fire but it's inhibited because a higher stimulus is required to raise potential above the action threshold. So it's important to think about how these periods factor into the waveform produced by the fish. Now, what is an electrocyte? Electrocytes are the constituents of the electric organ and can be best described as pancake or coin-shaped cylindrical cells that are tightly packed together. The excitability of their membranes is dependent on the famous voltage-gated ion channels, but specifically the location of these channels on the membrane is of importance as it will dictate discharge direction. What this means is for a posterior active configuration pictured, pictured here on the slide, for example, the net positive charge will flow in the direction of the fish's head since the positive ions are flowing through the posterior membrane in the anterior direction. This particular case is called a monophasic head positive pulse. We'll go into configuration and signal variations in, in the next slide, but this kind of sums up what an electrocyte is. So the type of electrocyte and con configuration of these electrocytes, so namely their, their geometry and membrane excitability, will be dependent on particular family of electric fish. So what this means is that the characteristics are determined by genetics. They're, they're inherited genetic qualities. The shape of the electrocyte, the excitability of the electrocyte, all that's going to come into play when, uh, uh, when producing a waveform. So for, when we're looking at the monophasic electric organ discharge example to the top, we deduce here that the, the, the electrocytes are acting like a DC battery. They're only stimulated on one side and the direction is fixed. Now, in the biphasic case, membrane excitability is alternating between both faces, so the behavior is more AC. Multiphasic case is the most complex. Uh, this is due to asynchronicity between not only between the multiple electric organs, but also within the pole switch uh, of the particular electrocyte group. So the, the more asynchronous, the more complex, uh, the more difficult it is for us to analyze. It, it's it's been um, hypothesized, actually confirmed, that this complexity is um, is directly correlated to mating. So mating signals, signal variation, account for uh, waveform complexity. Now we categorize bioelectric fields into two main types: weak or weak or strong. Where a weak electric organ discharge consists of pulses or waves up to one volt that are used for electrolocation communication, object detection, mating. Now strong EODs, uh, which range from 10 volts to 860 volts, can produce up to up to an amp of current. The signal is capable of stunning and killing other animals. It's used for hunting and defense. Uh, rays, catfish, electric eels are all examples of strongly electric fish, though most electric fish are strictly weakly electric. Now looking at the map, we see a clear geographical separation between the locations of strongly and weakly electric fish. It seems that strongly electric fish emerge on and north of the equator, whereas weaker fish reside in the southern hemisphere. And this particular genetic diversion, the capacity to produce a stronger electrocyte, uh, can be attributed to environmental differences between the mediums, notably temperature, oxygen content, and conductivity, but maybe even uh, something with the Earth's magnetic field if the fish's bodies are indeed acting like magnets. Uh, I want to note before moving on to the next slide that uh, most electrogenic fish capable of bioelectrogenesis are also electroreceptive, uh, and these electroreceptive sensors on their surface allows the fish to create cognitive mental images of their surroundings. I want to just apologize for the noise present in the in the previous take. My cohabitants decided to start vacuuming and moving chairs around and I had to cut the audio for a little bit but now we're back and we're ready to talk about electric eels. Electric eels are not eels. They are South American knife fish of the gymnotiform order. They're capable of generating both weak and strong EODs. And uh, they do this uh, uh, by using three, three organs that make up roughly 80% of their bodies, the sac's organ, the hunter's organ, and the main organ. The sac's organ and posterior hunter's organ work together to produce low-voltage discharge, while 
the main organ and anterior hunter's organ work together to produce high voltage discharge. Now, a study was conducted across uh, Greater Amazonia, which pulled a, a sample of 107 electric eels, and it, the findings of the study actually show three distinct uh, electric eel species exhibiting in genus diversification, the genus being electrophorus and the diversifications being uh, their speciation, so or diversion. So there, we've, there's Electrophorus electricus, Electrophorus voltae, and Electrophorus uh, vary. And some of the some of the key um, phenotypical differences are summarized here, mainly uh, head shape and clithrum locations, but also total length and uh, voltage. Uh, Electrophorus voltae with a peak voltage of 860 volts DC is uh, now considered to be the world's most powerful biological generator. Now we can attribute these genetic diversions to interspecific geographic differences. Shield streams where uh, Electrophorus electricus and Electrophorus voltae reside are permanently normoxic, uniformly low in conductivity, include rocky substrates, rapids, and waterfalls, and uh, are both situated on the eastern platform. This explains voltae and electricus's uh, genetic similarities. Um, I want to note that uh, the Guiana and Brazilian shields do differ in altitude and that Electricus, Electrophorus uh, voltae is found in north flowing rivers of the Brazilian shields, whereas Electrophorus electricus is found on the Guiana shield. Now, on the other hand, uh, Electrophorus vary is found in uh, lowland waters, and these lowland waters contain both low conductivity black waters and high conductivity white waters. So their ter their terraform streams are per permanently normoxic, while their floodplains are seasonally hypoxic. Uh, the here in this in this case, the water is slow flowing with non non rocky substrates without rapids or falls. And this variety that we found oh, we find in the variety that's found in these waters. Uh, can be attributed to the, the terrain differential between the source peaks and the basins in which they flow. And this uh, terrain differential or, or variation within the ecosystem explains the higher intraspecific variation that's found within electrophores vary. So what we can draw from this is that the divergent niche requirements uh, geographical ranges corresponding to distinct ecological conditions are the driving factors of the evolutionary split that led to the speciation events of these fish. So it's safe to assume that um, the similarities resulting from the rise of the shields in the Miocene uh, affected the evolution of Electrophorus electricus and Electrophorus voltae in comparison to electrophores vary. Now, the study actually pulled, um, evaluated a set of uh, concatenated uh, DNA genes, notably concatenated mitochondrial DNA and uh, concatenated nuclear DNA. Um, we There's more information with regards to this, the sequencing specifics on the NIH's uh, GenBank sequence database, but we have here um, uh, under the map kind of a tree of the different uh, genes evaluated and um, a table summarizing the interspecific divergence of koi in uh, these cases uh, via pairwise, uh, pairwise comparison. And uh, as we can see, the threshold is well above 2%, uh, the 2% recognition, recognition for new species in all uh, comparisons. So this indeed confirms the fact that there are uh, three electric eel um, species. So in this slide, we compare the, the speciation or speciation events to tectonic events, and we do this to um, emphasize the introductory point. So observing uh, plate tecton South American plate tectonics ac across the last 140 million years, we noticed two major continental events. And uh, okay, whether or not we can categorize tectonic events as events because they're constantly occurring uh, is a question that... I do not have the answer to at the moment, but, uh, but we just here in this case, like from the surface level interaction with the earth that I can pull from being on a continent or living on a continent that's moving uh, above the oceanic floor, um, we notice here two major events is South America and Africa breaking apart 
about 100 million years ago. I mean, the process leading up to them breaking apart took some time, but they broke apart about 100 million years ago, and that North and South America join uh, through the Isthmus of Panama, which isolates Atlantic and Pacific waters. So in the process leading up to the rise of the Isthmus, as we as we can see here in the in the images um, to the left, uh, we uh, South America experienced intense flooding, and logically, these the, the making the connection with marine animals. These floods would have allowed for a uh, free marine movement throughout the basin. Uh, now, it isn't until about 10 million years ago that the water started to drain significantly, and this this uh, this would isolate freshwater populations. And, and looking at the electric eel species tree gene tree that we have to the right here, we observe that the the initial uh, the first genetic diversion overlaps with this uh, drainage event. Uh, the first diversion occurring about uh, estimated to have occurred about 7.1 a million years ago. Uh, now the the for, the finalization of the formation of the isthmus uh, is the, te the the geological event that coincides with the second uh, genetic diversion uh, occurring in the Pliocene as well. The first, sorry, I didn't note the 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 drainage of the basins and uh, the first diversion occurred in the Miocene, and now the the finalization of the formation of the isthmus and the second genetic diversion occur in the Pliocene. Uh, the second diversion uh, estimated to have occurred about 3.6 million years ago, but it can also be attributed to like post-drain time factor that came into play because the closed uh, the shield populations uh, would, would have been more inbred, uh, electricus, uh, electroforce electricus specifically being the most inbred of the three. Now to draw some some conclusions, uh, I wanted to uh, recap some of the points, some of the general points made earlier, and uh, uh, you know open with a question on this tectonic theory, uh, one that the capacity to produce bioelectric fuels evolved from lack of contractility in the muscle. But if we look at it from like a gene standpoint, even though bio is not my my personal area of expertise, we look at it from a, from a gene standpoint. Uh, the genes responsible for lost contractility are also responsible for the electrical ability. So the balance, the, the mechanical electrical balance here being manifested. Uh, and as such, as a derivative from this genetic kind of trademark, uh, in all electric fish, it's, it's going to be the same group of amino acids that's substituted in the same voltage-gated sodium uh, channel so so it's the same protein channel that that's driving bioelectrogenesis and third uh, that it seems that tectonic movement is largely responsible for the emergence of this trait notably that it's found between South America and Africa that were once joined um, that there are uh, there's uh, overlap between uh, 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 genetic diversions uh, in, in a specific group that uh, uh, there's an overlap between the, the genet genetic diversions and the plate tectonics, uh, and with that uh, theory, um, w with that mindset, one, maybe it's something in the rock that is driving life itself, but that two, um, if we look at here the great ocean conveyor belt thinking, uh, okay, so the, 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 the rain um, softened the rock and turned it into set sediment or soil and that soil that sediment that mineral was um uh moving around as the ocean was was being transported by the ocean in the in the past when the isthmus wasn't present it's very probable that some of that sediment was transported to the pacific so uh it it, it seems like that would be a good place to look for more electric fish and uh, that kind of does it. I'll, I'll gladly take questions uh, via email or LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is Nora Slayman Hadar. My Virginia Tech email is N-O-R-A-S-H Norash at vt.edu. And if I'm, f I'm being a little flaky on my on my email, uh, there's my, my rapper profile, uh, my Nora Raps at gmail.com where you can contact me as well. Uh, thank you for your... Um, patience, your attention, um, and I'm looking forward to what you guys have to say about this. Thank you.